The next item of business is a debate on motion 3573 in the name of Fergus Ewing on developing forestry in Scotland. Can I invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now? I call on Fergus Ewing to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, 12 minutes, please. Uh, presenting officer, trees cover 18% of the land area of Scotland. Our forestry resources represent 45% of the UK total and 60% of UK softwood production. Forestry contributes almost £1,000 million a year to the Scottish economy and it supports 25,000 full-time equivalent jobs. Private plantings cover over 965,000 hectares, whilst the National Forest Estate covers 640,000 hectares, uh, some 8.2% of Scotland. Now, these impressive statistics emphasise, presenting officer, the enormous importance of woods and forestry to Scotland's people, to her communities, her economy and her environment. And they explain this government's unequivocal commitment to forestry and to maintaining the National Forest Estate. That commitment is backed by ambition, which we now want to extend. Having considered the progress made towards meeting the annual planting target of 10,000 hectares, we have extended our ambition. The draft climate change plan published last week by my colleague Rosanna Cunningham proposes to increase this target so that by 2024-25, we are creating 15,000 hectares of woodland per annum. As one of the very few economic activities that absorbs more carbon than it produces, and supplies low carbon materials for building, forestry, presiding officer, is crucial to our environmental objectives. Trees remove about 10 million tonnes of CO2 each year and are home to over 200 plant, bird and animal species, including some unique to Scotland. Some will rightly question this increase when, as I fully acknowledge, we have not yet managed to meet the previous annual target. But I hope to be able to reassure them today uh, why I consider this new target achievable and to reassure both Conservatives and Labour that our approach will address the sort of issues their amendments fairly highlight. And perhaps I can say at this point that I'm minded to accept both the Labour and the Conservative amendments, presiding officer, in, uh, in perhaps an unprecedented display uh, of magnanimity on my part. I wanted to extend that magnanimity to the Greens and I would have done so were it not for the fact that unfortunately the amendment is just a bit too prescriptive and I think by accepting it, it would effectively preempt the debate on the forestry bill and also preempt a proper consideration of the consultees to that bill whose views we need fully to take into account. But I'm happy if it, if it would help to meet with the Green representatives and I'm very happy to discuss that with a sympathetic eye. Uh, so I thought it would be useful to uh, ad-lib at that point. Uh, going back to the script, presenting officer. <laughs> sorry about that. We are putting in place all the necessary components for success. Funding, appetite, process, innovation, land, skills, and political will. We do intend to increase the financial support available for tree planting and management from 36 to 40 million pounds in the current year, provided our budget is supported, as I hope it will. And every opportunity, resources and future budgetary pressures allowing, I will seek to invest more funding and planting and be an advocate uh, there and end. Although our target has been challenging, there has been a lot of tree planting happening in Scotland between 2007 and 2015, uh, this government supported the creation of over 54,000 hectares of new woodland with investment of more than 230 million pounds. And our processing sector, which I believe is fair to say is globally renowned, has also made significant investments, welcome investments in recent years, a sure sign of confidence in and by the industry. And that includes firms such as James Jones and Sons and inward investors such as Norboard, who operate uh, in Terelia in my constituency. In 2015, 
the timber harvest was nearly 7 million tons. That's seven times the size of the 1976 harvest. Interest and investment in forestry in Scotland is growing steadily. Scotland created 83% of all new woodland in the UK in 2015-16. Timber production in Scotland has grown by 23% since 2007, and timber availability is projected to expand further to 11.9 million cubic metres by 2025. Now, the streamlining of processes is enabling this trend. The new forestry grant scheme has been well received and Forestry Commission Scotland has now approved over 7,400 hectares of new planting since the scheme opened in October 2015. 71% of this approved planting is productive, 29% uh, focusing on other benefits such as biodiversity or flood alleviation. We can streamline the approval process further and create more certainty for investors. Last summer, I appointed former chief planner, Jim McKinnon, to review and identify how the process could be improved. I accepted Mr. McKinnon's recommendations in principle and the Forestry Commission Scotland's plan to implement those recommendations will be published shortly. This plan will be key to delivering our new planting targets. The availability of land, presiding officer, is also key. Currently, Scotland only has 18% of forest cover compared with 37% for the EU as a whole, twice as much, and 31% worldwide. A study has shown that 30% of our land is suitable for growing trees without using prime agricultural land or planting on important conservation sites. There is clearly room for growth. I believe the case for increased woodland creation is compelling, but I know others remain to be convinced. Some are particularly concerned about the prospect of a return to 1980s practice when a monoculture approach to conifer plantation was implemented. Let me be clear. This government, will not, this government will not oversee any return to the bad old days of blanket forest planting. Ours is a vision, a modern vision, in which woodland expansion must respect modern standards of sustainable management such as the UK forestry, uh, forestry standard. Uh, and availability of land is a key issue and we will work closely with local authorities and of course communities in tackling it. We also want to see sustainable mixed land use, which is why I'm pleased to support the work being led by the National Sheep Association on sheep and trees to promote the benefits of tree planting for sheep farming. That doesn't mean sacrificing one land use for another. Farming and forestry can work well together when managed in an integrated way. And Scotland has plenty of land where planting trees is absolutely the right thing to do, and that will be our focus. Not in prime agricultural land or on valuable habitats for wildlife. To meet our tree planting ambitions, we must keep skilled professionals working across all sectors. We also need more young people to take up careers and opportunities in forestry. Uh, to join the many forest apprentices now working in the sector. The work of organisations like Scottish Forestry and Timber Technology Industry, Leadership Growth, OWLS and Lantra is crucial in this regard. Uh, and we should use all available powers and levers to establish modern statutory and operational requirements to support this valuable and growing sector. That is why I intend to introduce a bill, presiding officer, in this parliamentary session to complete the devolution of forestry and provide a new legislative framework. While we have consulted on our draft proposals and are currently considering responses, I want to reach out across Parliament to offer to work with members to get this framework and these arrangements right. And to go back off piece for a moment, I omitted to say that we have, of course, also worked with the Liberal Democrats uh, prior to today, uh, and I thought it correct that I should uh, uh, correct that omission from earlier on. Uh, that, that underscores the fact that I am determined to work with all members to try to get these matters right. Now, our aim is to preserve the knowledge, skills and expertise we have in place and to ensure that these are deployed to best effect in localities and communities. But we do want to build on the success of Forest Enterprise Scotland to create an enhanced development and management body which will allow us to maintain and indeed grow the national forest and state as an asset for the nation. Forest Enterprise Scotland already partners with the private sector and communities in the management of land 
supporting 11,000 jobs, many in rural areas. This work involves spending over £50 million pounds with predominantly SMEs working on the estate. The estate also supports over 100 projects with rural and urban communities on work including urban regeneration, renewable energy, affordable housing, leisure, recreation, mountain biking, opportunities for community businesses. I'm sure and I hope that I will receive many examples of these good works from members across the chamber during this debate. To date, managing the estate has involved small discrete purchases and disposals of appropriate land and forests, and that careful approach will continue, but we should also consider how, best, how to make best use of the resources realized from such sales. Presenting officer, if we are to fully develop the potential of trees, woods, and forests for Scotland, if we are to increase their contribution to our communities, our economy, and our environment, then we do need to work together, uh, and I hope that we can do so in this parliament. But there's a greater role for people and communities to play. Currently, over 200 community groups all over Scotland are involved in managing woodlands and forests. I intend to ensure that many more are involved and included in the future. I want to add to the success of the 31 communities which already own over 10,000 acres transferred under the National Forest Land Scheme. The largest forest owner in Scotland is in fact the government. Like the Greens, this government wants to see ownership increasingly devolved to communities. So today I can advise that Forest Enterprise Scotland is developing a new community asset transfer scheme, a digital resource to provide more information and support to communities seeking to buy or lease parts of the National Forest Estate. Planning officer, to conclude, modern Scottish forestry is indeed a rare thing. It's a win for communities, a win for the economy, and, a win for the environment. Our forests come in all shapes and sizes. The productive spruce forests of Galloway, the iconic native pine woods in my own constituency, and treasured small pockets of well-used local woodlands and glens scattered throughout our villages, towns, and cities. A study by WWF published last year highlights the challenges. Unless we produce more of our timber, and reduce dependency in imports, the current ratio of domestic to imported supply can only be supported until 2030. If we don't plant more trees by 2050, the UK will be importing nearly 80% of timber to meet demand. That surely is something that we should all work together to tackle. Which is why in moving the motion of my name, signing officer, I seek the support of everyone in this parliament in a shared national endeavour to fully develop the enormous potential offered by planting more forestry and more woodland. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I call on Peter Chapman to speak to and move Amendment 3573.1. Mr Chapman, seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I refer members to my Register of Interest. I am glad to be able to speak in this debate today, particularly as we await the final plans from the Scottish Government on the future arrangements for forestry management. And I think it is fair to say that there is a great deal of consensus across the Chamber on the goals and priorities for forestry management here in Scotland. We all recognise that forestry is a vitally important part of the rural economy. And I particularly welcome James McKinnon's report, which is a practical and clear document with many good recommendations. Now, with Scotland's forestry sector currently contributing around a billion pounds and supporting 25,000 jobs, it is vital that we encourage what can only be described as a growth industry. It is also important that forestry is valued in its own right and for our professionals to demonstrate that planting trees will secure the long-term supply of productive timber, sustain jobs in rural areas and help Scotland achieve its ambitious climate change targets. As forestry will soon come under the direct control of Scottish ministers, we must ensure that it is not subject to the whims of electoral cycles. This is an industry that requires a long-term view and a consistent mindset. My colleagues and I are clear that we must retain the knowledge, experience and long-term planning that we currently gain from the Forestry Commission. And indeed, I would argue that we should strengthen and develop further that skill base. And I would like to welcome the new increasing annual target rising to 15,000 hectares of new trees by 2025. 
And I believe that this is an achievable target. I am concerned, however, that with this government having missed its target of 10,000 hectares being planted every year since 2012, we are setting ourselves up for failure unless the process of applying for permission to plant is simplified, sped, out, sped up and cost taken out. Less than 20% of Scotland land area is currently forest, which compares poorly to Spain at 37%, Finland at 73% and the EU average of 37%. In North East Scotland, 17% of agricultural land is currently reported as farm woodland area, slightly more than 80,000 hectares. And I have, I have a good example here. I know a North East farmer, Mr John Munro, who demonstrated the potential benefits of farm woodlands on his farm. And after buying 60 hectares of heavy clay land in 1991, John set about establishing commercial woodland, mostly Sitka. And since then, he has succeeded very well. In taking advantage of high quality pine wood, ideally suited for timber processing, and working to deliver his stock over winter, ties in well to his farm business, and is now delivering profits and employing a member of staff. And this is a model that is absolutely the norm in Scandinavian countries. Across Finland, Sweden and Norway, most farmers are foresters. And it is nothing unusual for a farmer to harvest crops over the summer and to use the same equipment and tractors and to harvest timber over the winter months. And we need, I would argue, a complete change of mindset among the farming community here if we are to encourage more planting by farmers. Unlike Scandinavians, Scottish farmers are not natural planters of trees. And there is little history of farming and forestry being integrated in Scotland. The argument has often been that good sheep country has been used to plant trees and livelihoods have been lost as a result. But it, it is often the case that this land under trees will protect just as many jobs and deliver more output per, output per acre than it will farming sheep. However, not at this point, sorry, I haven't, I haven't much time. However, I am convinced that there are large swathes of land in Scotland where the sheep have already gone off the hills. But these areas have not been planted and are basically abandoned. Here is a valuable resource and a real source of income for the landowner being wasted. I agree with much, much of what James McKinnon says in his report. However, I do disagree with his suggestion of accredited agents having the authority to certify planting applications. I believe that decision needs to be taken by the Forestry Commission, but the FCS needs to tell its staff to be decisive and get on with it. I agree that informing and engaging communities should happen earlier and should be proportionate to the scale and impact of any scheme. And while subsidies do cover the first 10 years of planting, it takes decades more to be in a position where trees are mature enough to be valuable and to provide real income for the grower. So how do we support farmers who are effectively losing the income from their farmland over a long period? And perhaps when the Cabinet Secretary comes to presenting the draft forestry bill to this Parliament, he will consider ways that we could encourage the growth of farm woodland. Mm -hmm. Not only would this assist in making farmers less dependent on volatile food prices by diversifying their businesses, but it is vital to deliver our three planting targets. Now, Brexit undoubtedly poses a challenge for funding new forests post-2020. But the answer is simple. The money must be allocated. Reports tell us we are on, co on course to import nearly 80% of our timber needs by 2050. And we must, we must do better than that. So it is vital that we act now to ensure a strong forest production sector for the future. And of course, we need to ensure that we are planting the right trees to create forests that have real value for sawmills and won't just end up as expensive firewood. Since around 20, 2005, not only have we failed to meet our targets of 10,000 hectares, but unfortunately two thirds of the woodland that we have planted has been hardwood and that has a limited industrial use. These are not the trees that our sawmills require and this failure to plant sufficient high quality pine forests should have been seen much earlier and measures taken to rebalance planting. Thankfully, that has now been done. 
I am fully on board with focusing on Sitka planting as outlined by in Jim McKinnon's report. And of but of course, we cannot just roll out Sitka and ignore other commercial species. But there are clear advantages to Sitka. Its rotation age is only 40 years rather than 80, as with Scotch pine and larch. However, I fully recognise the days of blanket planting of single species are gone, and a well-designed forest nowadays will have open spaces and different varieties to encourage biodiversity. Please conclude. Can I just finish there then? I'll just say that uh, uh, we, could, we can save, we can carb carbon capture as well, we can help to uh, alleviate flooding, but we, uh, we know that uh, trees will, will uh, take in carbon. Presenting officer. Just move the amendment now, please. Thank my you. My colleagues and I are ready to work with the Scottish Government to deliver their ambitious And move your targets. amendment. Just move your amendment, please. But we remain concerned that not enough work, work is being done. On. I move the amendment <laughs> in my name. Can I, it's how long a conclusion takes. Can I now call uh, Rhoda Grant, please, to speak to move amendment 3573.2. Six minutes, and I know you won't be naughty. <laughs> <laughs> You're tempting me now, presiding officer. <laughs> we welcome the further devolution of forestry and indeed the Forestry Commission, um, and it should help the Scottish Government achieve their planting targets. But we also want to look at how we use our forestry and how we grow timber. We agree that the responsibility for forestry itself should be devolved. But alongside that, we need to work with other parts of the UK to preserve the benefits of working together in certain areas such as research and disease control. Neither the UK nor devolved governments will have the resources to replicate alone what has been achieved through shared resources. And we would urge the Scottish Government to look at ways in which research could be carried out as a joint venture throughout the UK to replicate that research and development work that people really value. The same with disease control as currently happens. The UK works well in this area with animal health um, and interagency working and something like that, um, linking up disease control and planting as well, would be very much desirable with the devolving of forestry to the Scottish Government. A number have expressed concern about how forestry will be managed going forward and the changes to the role of the Forestry Commission and indeed uh, the perception of a Land Scotland agency that will cover much wider than forestry. There's a fear that it will become a faceless bureaucracy, one step away from government, um, but impenetrable and unaccountable. It will be run by career civil servants who will know nothing about forestry and one of the benefits we are told of the Forestry Commission is that it is staffed by foresters who understand the industry and its producers. So we're not persuaded that one large organisation trying to do so many jobs uh, will work, and it also smacks of centralisation. I agree that the blanket planting of Sitka spruce throughout Scotland was one of the worst things that happened, and it was done mostly for tax breaks, and I'm glad that the Cabinet Secretary has acknowledged this and given the commitment that that won't happen going forward. But we do need more planting, and the Scottish Government, as has been stated before and indeed, with, as the Cabinet Secretary said, have failed to reach targets year on year and therefore we need a strategy that works and the McKinnon report looks at ways of achieving that by cutting through red tape and that's to be welcomed. We agree though with um, Comfort um, about the role he proposes for um, certifying forestry schemes below the threshold of environmental impact assessment um, that it should be carried out by the Forestry Commission staff and not private agents because certifying agents to do this work will also boost their business but at the same time uh, bring detriment to other businesses um, for agents. My reading of the report suggests that many of the problems that ex exist are due to the people involved and their knowledge of the system and that suggests to me that the systems in place need, um, need to be changed but also that staff require um, better training as well. Systems have to be in place to allow a more streamlined application process for those schemes that don't require an environmental impact assessment. Likewise, it needs to be clear where a in more in-depth application is required. To allow the system to work, we need a national plan where, of where we encourage planting, unlikely, 
and likewise where we would not necessarily want tree planting, such as on good agricultural land that's required for food production on, or in areas that would um, have a detrimental environmental impact. A plan that looks at where forests are required, not just for land use and wood production, but for the environment and indeed recreational uses. Forests close to towns and cities not only provide timber very close to market, but also provides excellent recreational areas, encouraging people out into our forests uh, for the good of their mental and physical health. However, areas that lend themselves to planting are often on poorer land, therefore away from towns and cities and also away from easy access. And we've got a lot of landlocked forests ready for harvesting, but getting the timber to market is a real problem. Rural roads are often narrow, of poor construction, poorly maintained, and a large number of heavy timber lorries can cause a lot of damage and therefore impact on other road users. Where possible, forest roads should be designed to get timber as close as possible to A roads and to railways. Railways are ideal um, because many of the tracks in our rural areas under, are underused and have capacity to take timber. But it does need planning, the proper sidings and loading equipment to get timber onto the rail line. A very brief Person, a last minute. Oh, I can't, sorry. Um, this, of course, requires um, government funding. Too often, this has not been well thought out and sustainable. Past planting grants have led to people chasing the funding. Therefore, the funding needs to be in place that ensures planting happens in the most appropriate places with a clear plan as to how you access the timber. Presiding officer, we will support the Conservative motion, which makes many of the points that we're making, albeit slightly differently. We also share concerns about the Green Amendment um, there are, um, and we have the disadvantage of speaking before them, so they can't make their points before we've spoken. But we don't wish um, national forestry privatised, and there's a fear that their amendment might lead to that. But I look forward to listening to what they say in debate. We welcome the debate um, and uh, getting the time to look at planning how we deal with forestry cons constructively. We will support the government to reach their planting targets but hold them to account if they don't, and I move the amendment in my name. Not bad, not bad, Ms Grant. Uh, can I uh, call now Andy Whiteman to speak to and move Amendment 3570.3. Six minutes, please. Six minutes, Presiding Officer. Six minutes, Six. precisely. Thank you, Thank you no Presiding more. Officer. Thank you. Uh, I welcome this debate on developing forestry in Scotland since it's nine years since it was last debated in uh, government business. I, I started my working life uh, in forestry, actually destroying the Burks of Aberfeldy to uh, plant conifer plantations on behalf of the Midland Bank in the 1980s. And I then went on to Aberdeen University to study forestry. And it was whilst I was at university that I campaigned against the afforestation of the peatlands of Caithness and Sutherland. I learned years later that, as a consequence of that, I was blacklisted from employment in the forestry sector. So I've got some experience of this topic. Um, having said that, we are we're a little bit disappointed in the lack of ambition that the government has for uh, forestry. On the 22nd of March this year, it will be the 50th anniversary of the Forestry Act of 1967. Notwithstanding devolution in 1999, the statutory framework for forestry and the responsibilities of the Forestry Commission has moved uh, on little. We welcome the complete devolution of forestry, of course, but in addition to reforming governance and new mechanisms to achieve forestation targets, a new act could, for example, open with a new suite of statutory purposes for forest policy in Scotland, including climate change mitigation, supporting the rural economy, advancing land reform, environmental restoration, and promoting social policy in the fields of health and well-being. In particular, a new act should incorporate a statutory duty on ministers to promote sustainable forest management and implement the UN Sustainable Development Goal, of which 15.2 states that by 2020, promote the implementation of sustainable management of all types of forests, halt deforestation, restore degraded forests, and substantially increase afforestation and reforestation globally. In that light, our amendment calls for two elements of a more ambitious approach to the future of forestry in Scotland. Uh, the first relates to the ownership of Scotland's expanding forest cover. This has become dominated uh, by owners who live far away from the land they own, often in offshore tax havens, and whose motivations are limited solely often to the financial and tax advantages associated with uh, ownership. A few years ago, I undertook a study into the pattern of private ownership of Scotland's forests, and I was astounded when I asked the Forestry Commission about the source of ownership data 
that they had submitted to the UN Economic Commission for Europe in 2011 to be told that it was based upon estimates, estimates which in turn were derived from a survey carried out UK-wide in 1977. Unlike most European countries, the Scottish Government and Forestry Commission collect minimal information on forest holdings and publish nothing. What we now know is that Scotland stands at the extreme end of countries in Europe with the most concentrated pattern of private ownership. Over 44% of forest holdings in Scotland are over 100 hectares in extent. Sweden is next at 10%. The European average is 0.7%. The majority of Scotland's private forest area is owned by absentee owners, and a third of those live outside Scotland. Across Europe, by contrast, forestry is owned by cooperatives, communities uh, and municipalities. In countries such as Sweden and Finland, companies such as Sudra and Metzalito Cooperative own substantial extents of forests managed on behalf of their uh, members. Uh, the second part of my amendment relates to reform of the governance of the National Forest Estate. And I heard what the Cabinet Secretary uh, said in relation to this, and I look forward to further discussions on this. 25 years ago, I asked the prominent historian of the Highlands and Islands, Dr. James Hunter, to write an editorial for a magazine I was editing about the future of forestry in Scotland. Now, contrary to the prevailing orthodoxy of the time, he noted that, and I quote, the Forestry Commission is to Scottish forestry what collectivisation was to Soviet agriculture. And he went on to argue uh, for reform in the way that state forests uh, are managed and made a very good point, I thought. Public ownership uh, of land does not necessarily mean state ownership. Real public ownership means ownership by the public. And there's a common belief that the Forestry Commission owns the National Forest Estate. It does not, of course. All land managed by the Forestry Commission is owned by Scottish ministers. Section 3 of the 1967 Act, which the government is intent on, on repealing, makes clear that the Forestry Commission is merely the manager of land placed at its disposal by Scottish ministers. A new Forestry Act, in our view, should allow a much wider range of bodies, such as community groups, environmental charities, cooperatives and local councils, who can be appointed by Scottish ministers to manage parts of the National Forest Estate, removing the monopoly currently enjoyed by the Forestry Commission. Finally, Presiding Officer, I want to raise two further uh, matters in the short time I have available. First, on achieving the government's target for forestry expansion. This will be challenging. As the Forestry Commission briefing, uh, helpfully distributed by the Cabinet Secretary yesterday, makes clear, we know where forestry expansion should happen in broad terms, but it is not happening. Given the climate change imperative of forestry expansion, we need to develop new mechanisms through planning and fiscal policy to make new forestry obligatory. Second, the Forestry Commission repositioning programme is based on recommendations from a review in 2004. In an answer to a written question in October last year, I was told by the Cabinet Secretary that the Scottish Government has yet to decide on any further sales programme beyond those areas already notified. I understand that the Cabinet Secretary is in fact in possession of lists of new proposed sales of the National Forest Estate and will welcome whether he can confirm this is the case or not and whether he will let Parliament know of such plans as soon as possible. In conclusion, presiding officer, is Scotland simply a resource colony for distant corporate industrial and financial interests, or is it a country to be developed for the benefit of the communities who live and work in rural Scotland? I move the amendment in my name. We now move to the open speeches, and we are tight for time, no time in hand. Any interventions will have to be contained within your six minutes. Uh, I call on Emma Harper to be followed by Finlay Carson. Thank you, President Officer. Before I continue, I want to remind members that I am the Parliamentary Liaison Officer for the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Economy and Connectivity. Forestry, woodlands and trees are of great importance to Scotland's rural communities. Forests contribute to the local economy, providing jobs and creating wealth. Forests attract visitors to Scotland and create opportunities for our tourism sector. They are important to our cultural heritage, having inspired generations of artists and writers. Long-established woodlands form part of the historic environment as evidence of earlier settlements and land use patterns. The forestry industry contributes almost a billion pounds per year to the Scottish economy and supports more than 25,000 full-time equivalent jobs. The National Forest Estate is one of Scotland's greatest natural assets and generates 395 million and 9 million visitors each year. 
Dumfries and Galloway, where I was born and live now, is one of the most wooded regions of Scotland. The region pro produces around 30 per cent of Scotland's annual timber harvest and has a major processing capacity through two large sawmills at Lockerbie and Dalbiti, in addition to a number of smaller facilities. The timber industry employs around 3,000 people across the region. However, continued growth of the industry and increased mechanisation has led to a recognised skills gap. Last year, I welcomed the Minister for Employability and Training to Dalbiti to visit forestry machinery suppliers Jas P. Wilson. Jas P. Wilson are an example of a company working with young people to fill some of these skills gaps. The Minister met apprentices and found out more about the company's partnership with Dalbiti High School. Minister Hepburn got to see firsthand the really positive work they have been doing to offer work experience for pupils, in some cases leading to full apprenticeships paid at a living wage. Offering our young people meaningful training opportunities in local businesses is vital to our region's economy and indeed will help address national skills shortages in some important areas of activity like the forestry industry. I am pleased that the SNP Government will introduce a forestry bill to complete the devolution of forestry. The bill will ensure that the Scottish Government has control of all aspects of forestry and transfer the powers and duties of the forestry commissioners as they relate to Scotland to Scottish ministers. It will see the establishment of a forestry and land management body to focus on the development of the national forest estate. In December, a detailed analysis of the challenges facing the sector by Jim McKinnon, as has been mentioned, was published, outlining a number of recommendations to reduce the complexity and cost of tree planting, all of which have been accepted in principle by the Cabinet Secretary. These will include streamlining the process to approve sustainable planting schemes, earlier engagement between tree planting businesses and communities, and a dedicated National Forestry Commission Scotland team to deal with complex proposals. These actions will help to ensure that we reach our manifesto con commitment to plant 10,000 hectares of trees every year until 2022, and to hasten the approval of planting. This will help to end the uncertainty over the future of forestry, encouraging more private investment in the sector. Stuart Goodall, the Chief Exec of CONFOR, recently praised the Cabinet Secretary for his real political will to tackling barriers to greater tree planting and his commitment to working with the sector to reach £22 million a year. These actions are especially important given the substantial support the sector receives from the EU. At this time of uncertainty for so many rural industries, the Scottish Government is focused on creating stability and continued investment in the sector. It is of extreme importance to reassure investors that Scotland is open for business. The Scottish Government has held summits with the forestry sector to listen to their concerns and ambitions. The Cabinet Secretary has also met with leading representatives from forestry management and investment companies to provide reassurance that the Scottish Government is committed to seeing the forestry sector thrive. Lastly, as well as the economic importance of the sector, it is crucial to recognise the role of forestry that it has to play in achieving Scotland's climate targets. Trees and woodland can help us adapt to existing and future impacts of climate change, providing opportunities to store carbon, combat air pollution and help reduce the risks of flooding. In 2009, the Scottish Parliament passed the most ambitious climate change laws anywhere in the world, and we have met the headline target of reducing carbon emissions by 42 per cent by 2020, six years early. Scotland's Climate Action Plan, published last week, sets out how we intend to continue this progress, and forestry is an important piece of the jigsaw. By 2032, Scotland's woodland cover will increase from around 18 per cent to 21 per cent of the Scottish land area. And by 2050, Scotland's woodlands will be delivering a great level of ecosystem services, such as natural flood management and biodiversity enhancement. 
The forestry sector is so important in many capacities, and I hope that we will see support from the government motion across the chamber today and for the action the SNP has taken to deliver our tree planting targets, instill confidence and stability in the se sector, and maintain the national forest estate as an asset for the nation. Thank you. Finlay Carson, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Although the forestry sector employs over 25,000 people across Scotland, the industry is of particular importance to the economy of rural Scotland, including my own constituency of Galloway and West Dumfries. Indeed, Dumfries and Galloway has the largest uh, forest park in the UK and is one of the most forested regions in Scotland, producing somewhere around 30% of Scotland's annual timber harvest. The timber industry is a major employer with, in the region with over 3,000 jobs across all sectors. And many of this chamber will have heard of BSW Timber in Dobiti, with one of the largest sawmills in the country. But I want to direct my remarks today at the governance of the sector. As we know, the Scottish Government recently consulted on the future of forestry in Scotland, ahead of bringing their forestry bill to Parliament. One of the central themes of that bill will be the new organisational arrangements for Forestry Commission Scotland, and in the recent consultation, respondents were specifically asked about their views on the establishment of a dedicated forestry division in the Scottish Government and an agency, an executive agency, to manage Scotland's national forest estate. I look forward to seeing what the Scottish Government brings forward in their bill, but the cynic in me is more than a little concerned that we are witnessing yet again an attempt by this SNP government to centralise and interfere, this time with forestry, with little regard for the wider implications that this will have in the industry. If the government do decide to press ahead with absorbing the Forestry Commission into the Scottish Government, we must see an approach that recognises the long-term nature of forestry as an industry. Excessive tinkering in line with electoral cycles should be avoided at all costs. Furthermore, I would urge the Cabinet Secretary to ensure that under new arrangements, a new government department would be underpinned by some form of independent ex or external scrutiny. It is in all our interest that Scotland has a viable forestry sector from which the benefits for local economy, communities and the environment can be maximised. Whatever is decided, I would urge the government to come to a decision as soon as possible, because at the moment there is a great deal of uncertainty which is negatively impacting on the industry. Indeed, the Forestry Commission Scotland's annual report they raise concerns that, and I quote, uncertainty over its future organisational status has caused difficulty in managing business as usual and has led to increased losses in key staff. Deputy Presiding Officer, concerns surrounding the proposed changes have been raised by a number of organisations such as the Galloway and Southern Ayrshire Biosphere. In their response to the consultation, they highlighted a feeling that the changes would ultimately result in the centralisation of services and decision making. They go on to make the very valid point that one of the main strengths of the current arrangements is regional management. This allows for a local approach with a strong local knowledge base which can be easily engaged with by the local community. In many sectors, our SNP government talk the talk about a more local approach, but up to now haven't walked the walk, so perhaps this is a time to do just that. The Woodland Trust also highlighted the risk of professional skills and expertise being lost if a new government department was set up. Expertise and knowledge that is essential to the successful management of our forests. I'm not standing here today to claim that the current arrangements are perfect and that no changes are needed at all. However, the government must use an evidence-based approach and heed the concerns of stakeholders to ensure that any proposals truly improve the current system and bring tangible benefits. This simply cannot be another SNP exercise of centralising power. I would urge MSPs to read James McKinnon's analysis of the current arrangements for the consideration and approval of forestry planning proposals to get an insight into some of the problems the sector is facing. And it's clear there is a strong desire across the entire sector for things to work more effectively. So when the Cabinet Secretary brings forward the Forest Bill to Parliament, we, are on this, we on this side of the chamber will be constructive and open-minded. In making changes, it's important to guard against losing things that currently work. And one of the things I will be looking out for is any attempt by this government to become more cumbersome in asserting their authority. To conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, Scotland needs a thriving forestry sector 
and today's debate has provided us with opportunity to recognise the importance of forestry to our ec uh, rural economy and communities and environment. We will wait to see what lies in store for the sector, but we must avoid a micromanaged approach that sees a loss of expertise and local knowledge from the sector. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson, followed by Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And let me uh, make some observations on what I think is likely to be a fairly consensual debate. We're all travelling in the same direction, and I think that's uh, a good place to be. Uh, forestry, of course, has always been a strategic uh, uh, product. In 1511, when the great Michael was launched, it was the biggest uh, capital ship in the world, weighing 1,000 tonnes. It was 73 metres uh, long, and it required the clearing of every single tree in Fife and the importation of, of timber uh, from uh, the Baltics uh, and, indeed, from France. So, timber in the 16th century was playing an important part in, in national life and of course required a huge uh, uh, replanting program following the building of the Great Michael. And of course, when the Forestry Commission was founded by the Act of 1919, uh, it was in the aftermath of World War I, which had 40,000 kilometers of trenches in France, uh, which were largely lined by timber. And the percentage of the UK that was then covered by forestry has dropped to something in the order of 4%. So therefore, timber is not simply an amenity. It's not even simply uh, something that feeds our industry. It is a matter of strategic uh, interest. Um, it's worth saying that uh, in 1919, in one of the uh, debates in the House of Commons, uh, one of the Labour members, uh, Will Thorne, uh, in uh, addressing the issue of where the land would be found uh, to plant trees, because that was an issue then as it is now, he simply said, pinch it, take it over. I think we've got a little more sophisticated in our approach uh, since then. But nonetheless, uh, it is a substantial issue. Where is the land to come from? I welcome uh, very much hearing uh, Peter Chapman, and I agree with him in this, uh, that we need to find ways of showing farmers that there is an intrinsic value to them, to their businesses, uh, in making some of their land uh, available for forestry. Um, I personally have some interest in uh, uh, using forests uh, for shelter. I think farmers in some circumstances will find that it's useful for that. I say that because where we live, we are surrounded in three sides by tree and it would be pretty open to the elements if we were not uh, surrounded by trees. They're also an amenity for us. Uh, in the forest that surrounds us, we have foxes, roe deers, badgers, weasels, barn owls, buzzards, woodpeckers, and a whole raft of other things. And that's true of forests uh, across Scotland, across the UK. So as a national asset, they are something that's of interest to everyone, not simply uh, to the proper industrial interests of bodies like CONFOR, uh, but to everyone who benefits emotionally, practically, and economically. Uh, for those of us like myself who enjoy walking, forests are among the most attractive places to go walking, uh, provided that is there are forest trails. The bit of forest around me is an example of uh, the errors that can be made in the past. The forest uh, paths through there are all but overgrown. Uh, the forest has never been thinned. I think the person who planted it, and I'm not quite sure who it was, by the way, I think, the per and that addresses the point that Mr. Whiteman made, uh, the person who planted it basically took the money and run. It will cost more to take that forest down than it is likely to realize in economic benefit. So the management of forests is very important indeed. And that's why I very much welcome Jim McKinnon's uh, report on forestry. I think it's well informed and well researched. Jim is an excellent fellow with only one major uh, defect to his name. He is a supporter of forest mechanics. And how sad is that, uh, one has to say. Uh, fair, uh, I think it's forest mechanics, uh, Cabinet Secretary. I'm pretty sure it is. Um, I apologize, Jim, if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's correct. Um, but, uh, but in Scotland, we have beautiful land and we have opportunities uh, for planting more forestry. Um, I think Rhoda Grant was correct in saying we've got to plant it where we can harvest it. The one thing he, she missed, and 
I would have liked to intervene, uh, was uh, that there is opportunity in some places for marine removal of forestry as well. And I saw a very effective scheme of that uh, when I visited Rasi uh, to, uh, to, to open uh, the new pier there as a minister. Uh, I think it was probably the last time I met Charles Kennedy and we had an excellent chat together, as we always did uh, whenever uh, we met him. The number of jobs in forestry can go up. It's substantial already. Uh, because the number of uses to which we're putting forest products is increasing. It's now part of biomass, more of our houses are timber framed, and therefore it's important that we uh, have uh, access to our ready supply of forestry goods. And climate change, yes, of course particularly new plantings, because young trees are particularly adapted to absorbing CO2, whereas older established forests that are left to moulder, perhaps as the one that surrounds our house, um, are less adept uh, at uh, absorbing CO2. So we've got to make sure we replant after we uh, grant permission for forests to come down. The final thing, uh, presiding officer, is, of course, I welcomed last week uh, the assent from the Tory benches from Mr Chapman uh, that our share of the support for agriculture and forestry would remain the same after 2020. I want to see that delivered because that's important for this industry as for rural Scotland as a whole. Presiding officer. I call Claudia Beamish to be followed by Graeme Day. Thank you, presiding officer. Forestry bestows us with numerous benefits, as discussed in the Chamber today. The Forestry Policy Group depicts some of these and some of the scope excellently, stating woodlands can double as, I quote, a bank, a playground, meeting place, nature reserve, classroom, larder, gym, mental health spa, and a centre for rehabilitation of those who need help to reorientate their lives, indeed. With regards to my portfolio, as mentioned by others, forestry is salient as it is the only sector delivering a net emissions reduction so far acting as nature's benevolence in, climate change, in the climate change challenge. That the volume of carbon sequestrated is set to decrease in coming years is a significant missed opportunity. So therefore, <clears throat> the climate change plan in draft laying out the Scottish Government's renewed ambition for woodland creation is to be welcomed. And though RSPP, RSPB have stated that, I quote, woodland management grants and subsidies must be better targeted to ensure that wildlife is also protected and the negative effects of climate change are mitigated while still supporting rural livelihoods and economy. I agree with this view and I hope the Shadow Cabinet Secretary does as well. One such opportunity is agroforestry, which has multiple benefits and fits interestingly perhaps with the comments of others such as Peter Chapman um, on the encouragement of farmers to, have, um, to plant more woodland. The significance of uh, agroforestry is recognised by the Forestry Commission Scotland and it's also interesting to look to France where the law passed by the French government on the future of agriculture, food and forestry was definitively adopted in their parliament supporting um, agroforestry agri, agro and the UK Commission Committee on Climate Change has actually stressed the need and I quote to address barriers to an awareness of agroforestry. Also we must be constantly aware and challenge ourselves to ensure that we consider the tensions between forestry planting and peatland restoration in relation to climate change and in protecting our fragile ecosystems and wildlife. In terms of protecting our forests and woodlands it is also essential that we address the issue, which is certainly very challenging, which we were discussing this morning in committee, uh, of deer management. And in my view, um, and that of others, I believe, the need for more robust management structures uh, to protect our trees. For, for tree health, Rhoda Grant has already explored the need for collaborative research across the UK. I would also highlight the importance of the provenance of seedlings and highlight the work of nurseries such as Ravenswood Nursery Cleghorn in South Scotland in this ambition. There are indeed very rich opportunities for community ownership of woodlands and forests and I welcome the commitments of the Cabinet Secretary today and I also listen carefully to the comments of, of um, the, the Green Party on this. There might, there might be 
It might be small parcels of land near to villages and towns, or indeed in towns and cities even, for recreational use and contributing to biodiversity through community management. There are also much more adventurous opportunities, such as in South Scotland, where there is a wealth of woodland sites owned and developed by community groups already. These sites add diversity to the forest culture and are often due praise for their focus on community and on conservation. The Gordon Community Woodland Trust is a prime example of this progressive work and the group purchased a Ber the Berkshire, Berkshire site in 2002 with financial assistance from the Scottish Land Fund and the first funding for a land purchase out with the Highlands indeed. Today the woodland is far more accessible as a space used by mental health outreach groups and the local uh, primary school, among others. It is managed by motivated and dedicated volunteers in the community, turning a small profit from Christmas tree sales, but delivering huge benefits to community cohesion. And we do need structures that enable more community and cooperative ownership across Scotland. In my own region, I want to highlight the exciting range of opportunities for uses of wood not mentioned by others. Uh, there's the opportunity of small-scale biomass to support rural uh, uh, fuel poverty, uh, to tackle fu fuel poverty. There's industrial biomass um, on quite a small scale as well, such as BHC Structure, Structural Steel Limited in Carnwath, who own their own forestry specifically for their use in their own biomass boilers in their factory. There's also native um, wood used for house building. And there are also many craft and art opportunities with wood. Uh, so many of our native woods are fine for carving from holly to oak. And I highlight one example, the, the Tweed Valley Forest Festival, which will be um, taking place in October to highlight these issues. And many MSPs can promote these issues across their own regions and constituencies. Finally, I want to highlight the land use strategy and one of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, already mentioned by Andy Whiteman. I commend both these to the Cabinet Secretary as opportunities for forest focus. The status of the land use strategy merits further consideration and the planting of trees, the what and the where and the why, can be addressed through guidance the strategy and indeed the bill could bring. And as far as the UN uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 15.2, I won't read out again what it states as it's already been read by another member, but this is certainly a global aspiration we should be contributing to. There should indeed be a shared national endeavour, as the Cabinet Secretary said, and we can all explore the way forward together. Thank you. Um, people are starting to run over time, so please curtail it a bit, please. And I call on Graham Day to be followed by Edward Mountain. Uh, presiding officer, I want to look at this issue from the standpoint of meeting our sequestration targets and the, the role that farming can play in this. That's not to diminish the importance of forestry from a commercial and related economic perspective. Contributing £1 billion a year to the Scottish economy and supporting 25,000 jobs as the sector does really matters, as from a reducing emissions perspective, does using wood instead of other materials in construction. For as convener of the Environment and Climate Change Committee, and given this Parliament today commenced its scrutiny of the new climate plan, I want in the main to focus my contribution on carbon sequestration at the initial stage, as it were. That said, there's a common thread running through the replanting issue, whether you approach it from a climate change or biodiversity, flood management or health benefits, water quality or commercial perspective. And that's the raft of challenges which require to be overcome if we were to start planting 10,000 hectares a year and move on to 15,000 hectares by 2024-25 and increase woodland cover from 18% to 21% by 2032 and of course the actions this will require. It's only fair to offer some perspective to this issue and point out that whilst the 10,000 hectare target has not been reached to date, in 2015-16 Scotland was responsible for 83% of the new woodland created across these islands last year. And in terms of delivery and ambition in this area, we are light years ahead of England, Northern Ireland and Wales. But the fact is we've set targets and will clearly require a change in attitude and approach if we're to get to the kind of planting levels we require to secure all of these necessary benefits. And of course, ensure that there's not a crisis around access to wood for commercial purposes in years to come. We need to get over that old mantra that planting trees on less productive ag agricultural land is somehow a sign of farming failure. To find a means of making it easier for tenant farmers 
to plant on their farms without suffering detriment, and to be, ident to be identifying parcels of land that currently are not being util utilised for any meaningful purpose, the kind that Peter Chapman mentioned, and which would be suited to hosting forestry on whatever scale, and to deploy the land use strategies on a regional and more local scale to ensure we begin to integrate land use far better than we've done up until now. Implementation of the McKinnon Report, where it identifies ways to remove barriers to planting, will help us on this journey, as in terms of enticing farming participation, will the move to allowing farmland planted under the Forestry Grant Scheme to still be eligible for basic payments, and topped up by the Scottish Government's planned exploration of a scheme which would see farmers paid for sequestering carbon through tree planting from 2020 onwards, as identified in the, the uh, climate plan, we might just secure a real breakthrough. Well, there's much more that we should be demanding of farmers in emissions reduction terms without increasing financial support. There is nothing wrong with incentivising them to deliver new step change behaviour that brings about measurable carbon sequestration benefits. And there is some good work going on already, both in terms of establishing new woodlands and improving management of existing small scale ones. With regard to the latter, I was interested to hear recently about leader funding being used to support the first stage of the innovative Argyle Small Woods Cooperative Project, which is helping farmers and other small woodland owners manage those woodlands. And in terms of the former, some interesting work is going on in central Scotland with the CSGN providing support and advice to farmers within the Green Network area around opportunities for woodland creation. That's laying the foundations for farmers to access the SRDP's forest grant scheme. The last 15 months has seen 1,500 hectares of woodland approved and supported by £10 million in funding. Clearly, courtesy of Brexit, the future nature of leader and SRDP, SRDP is in doubt, along with a 55 per cent underwriting of the forest grant scheme from the European Agricultural Fund for Rural Development. But in the short term, at least, we have these funding streams accessible for these important purposes and to establish some momentum. In increasing planting in keeping with the Woodland Carbon Code, though, we need to be mindful of another environmental impact, that of deer. The deer management issue is one the uh, Environment, Climate Change and Landform Committee has been wrestling with these past few months, concluding its extensive evidence gathering only this morning. The public purse in Scotland is facing an annual bill going forward of around £30 million to install new fencing and repair existing protections to keep deer out of our current forest footprint and allow it to flourish. And as we deploy public money to fund new planting with all its benefits, we must seek to reduce the risk of the double whammy of having to then increase spend on measures to protect that investment from the impacts of deer. I believe the Central Scotland Green Network Scheme already has a fencing element to the funding. Presiding officer, we will always need to fence, but I would contend that we need to strike a better balance between that and culling. Another challenge for the forestry uh, for forestry is coping with the ravages of disease, with 12,000 uh, hectares of publicly owned woodland having had to be cleared over the past six years in response to disease impacts. So I think it does make sense that while full control of our forestry will be passing to Scotland, we will still maintain cross-border cooperation on plant health alongside developing common codes and shared research. The UK forestry standard is helpful, for example, in resisting the pressure from some quarters to allow planting on peat of a depth of more than 50 centimetres, something that is completely counterproductive in carbon sequestration terms. And it is welcome that it is to be, uh, the, to be revised to improve the sustainability of woodland development. In finishing, though, I, I would note, as others have, the concerns of respected bodies such as the Woodland Trust around an aspect of full devolution of forestry functions. As we've heard, they are fearful of the consequences of forest policy and regulation being moved in-house, as it were, to be overseen by a forestry division of the Scottish Government. These concerns um, around impact may well be unfounded, but I hope the Cabinet Secretary in closing might address these directly. More importantly, the Scottish Government will proactively engage with those who hold them in order that we secure support for and confidence in future governance of the sector. Presiding officer. Edward Mountain to be followed by Richard Lyle. Presiding officer, thank you. New woodland in the correct location with the appropriate species planted well is not only good for the environment, but also vital to the economy. It's widely recognised that by 2035, not only will we not be producing enough, uh, sorry, by 2035, we will not be producing enough timber to satisfy the needs of our timber processors. Processors that our cabinet secretary and I know well, such as in Gordon's in Nairn, Norbo by Inverness and James Jones in Ms. Stodlock. Now, there's suggestions that the industry can offset this by smoothing, which effectively means reducing harvesting in the lead-up and post-critical period. 
but this is effectively putting a handbrake on our industry, and it's not something that I would naturally ever encourage. However, with a long lead time in timber to production, I see little option at this stage. So why has this come about? Simple answer is that government has failed to reach the planting targets they set themselves, a deficit that has been repeated every year since 2012. Now, before anyone says that even if we had reached those targets, with forests taking in some case 60 years to mature, we still would have had a, had a, not had enough timber, they would be wrong. Forestry starts producing from a fan around the 18-year point, and although these would not be substantial saw logs, it would be timber that we could use. So how far are we behind the planting targets? On the basis of the targets announced in 2012, with 100,000 hectares by 2020, we needed to plant 10,000 hectares per annum. As we entered 2017, we are considerably behind that target. Industry is telling us that we need to plant, to make up the shortfall, we'll need to plant 13,000 hectares per year up until 2022, if we are to reach the government's target. Latest indications from the government suggest that they'll be happy for 10,000 hectares per annum. But there is no clear evidence that this is likely. Indeed, it seems very unlikely, given the evidence that I've looked at. So I want to look at the reasons for failure and what we could perhaps do. And there's two areas that I want to look at. First of all, grants, and then the consultation process. Now, analysis of previous applications suggests that costs of establishment for forestry, that grants need to be in the region of £4,500 per hectare. Simple maths would suggest to achieve a target of 13,000 uh, 13, hectares per annum, the budget should be in the region of £59 million. Or if the new target of 10,000 hectares per annum is accepted, it will need to be 45 million. The fact is, in the 2017 and 18 budget for planting, the, the figure set aside is 40 million. Now, I've heard arguments that the budget has been set on the basis of what the Forestry Commission see as coming forward in the way of forestry glance. But of course, that's a circular argument. If potential applicants can't see sufficient grant funding, they won't bother to apply. Why? Well, simply because the whole application process is long, tortuous, and expensive. And if you don't have a reasonable chance of success, why indeed would you bother? Now, on the consultation process, I'd like to say at the outset that I broadly welcome the report by Jim McKinnon. There are some bits I don't agree with, and perhaps I could discuss these further with the Cabinet Secretary at another time, but whilst he's still abiding by his 2017 resolution. But I speak from bitter experience when I say the, cons can, uh, the consultation process can be soul-destroying. There are some that I've been involved in, one in particular which aimed at creating 100, uh, sorry, 1,000 hectares of new Caledonian pine forest in the Cangorms that I still bear the scars from. Whilst I accept the need to protect the environment, that particular scheme seemed to tick all the boxes. It still took 10 years to be approved, and I really can't remember how many site meetings and consultation reports that were required. No wonder forestry doesn't get planted. So I believe that the government, with all the other agencies who rightly have a say, need to identify areas where we should see forestry planting. They should then produce maps showing where there is a presumption in favour of forestry. They then should instruct the Forestry Commission Conservators to follow that map and support them in the decisions they make regarding the applications. So, in summary, I am truly concerned about the timber supply and it will not meet the demands of our industry, especially when we reach 2035. I support the government's original planting ambitions and I am disappointed that we have failed to achieve them. It is clear to me also that the government has not allowed sufficient grant support to achieve their damnly adjusted new targets. I support what Jim McKinnon says in his report, but want to look more closely on the way forward in relation to the Forestry Commission and the use of certified agents. I believe the government must look at making the whole application process a lot easier, with a presumption in specific areas for forestry planting to speed up the process. Sadly, I believe if these issues are not addressed, then I have serious concerns that Scotland's forestry will, hold back, will be held back. The knock-on effect is that it will be bad for the environment, 
bad for the industries, and especially the industries in my region and the Cabinet Secretary's constituency, where they are so important not only to provide employment, but also skills and training for people in the forestry sector. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Richard Lyle, followed by Mike Rumbles. Thank you, uh, President Officer. Can I begin this afternoon by welcoming the opportunity to speak in this important debate on the forestry sector in Scotland, particularly with, as a member of this Parliament's Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. In my remarks this afternoon, President Officer, I will e intend to echo much of what has been said by my colleagues, maybe not Mr Mountain, but in particular I wish to reiterate how valuable the forestry sector is to Scotland and indeed the actions that this SNP Scottish Government will take to showcase just how much we value the sector. Presiding officer, Scotland's forests and woodlands are one of their greatest and indeed our most valuable rural assets, with the sector being worth one billion per annum, supporting approximately 25,000 jobs. It is clear that the forestry sector is one which has the potential to continue to grow, I know that's a pun, uh, and growth going from strength to strength. And I believe it's our ambition in the SNP for them to expand and flourish, to continue to support employment and growth for Scotland's rural economy. Indeed, it is incredibly important to remember that the forestry sector does not just do well for Scotland's economy, but it plays a hugely important role in tackling climate change, protecting and growing biodiversity, natural flood management, and of course contributes to the improvement of general health and well-being across Scotland. In short, it is a sector which contributes so much more than money to our nation. That's why I'm sure this SNP government is de determined to reduce the complexity, duration and cost of tree planting applications and, as members will be aware, commissioned a report by Jim McKinnon, CBE. The report made a number of recommendations, which I know the Cabinet Secretary has accepted in principle. But this Government went further from that report. First Minister outlined in her programme for Government a commitment to announce actions to speed up and streamline approved procedures for sustainable planting schemes. The Scottish Government is exploring the options open to stimulate and increase planting, and I know that they have plans to announce actions later in the year to speed up the process of planting, particularly for those sustainable schemes. It is important to note that the success of the industry lies with the relationship that it has developed between our committed Cabinet Secretary and the industry themselves. Indeed, I note that Stuart Goodall, Chief Executive of CONFOR, has said that Scotland is planting, on average, over 15 million trees a year. And I know that the Cabinet Secretary is working with the sector in a determined drive to plant more. There is an understanding of the benefits and the real political will to tackle the barriers to greater tree planting. And I think that's a welcome reflection by Mr Goodall, as it shows that this Government is not only working to fulfil its commitments, but is fostering a relationship with the sector that will see it go from strength to strength. I highlighted earlier in my remarks the benefits of the Forestry Commission to climate change, and it's on that point I wish to reflect. Because we live in a world at the moment where climate change is being questioned by some across the world, or maybe just across the Atlantic. But climate change is a very real issue indeed. And we have a proud record of our work to tackle climate change. The First Minister represented us at the UN Global Climate Change Summit in France not so long ago and our continual punching above our weight and our efforts to tackle this important issue are well noted. Our plans are outlined in the draft climate change plan show that we, not, we are not resting on our laurels, but working hard to make that change we must see. That is why by 2032, we must have the ambition that Scotland's woodland cover will go from around 18 to 21 per cent of the Scottish land area. And this is important because these new woodlands will absorb greenhouse gases, provide confidence for the forestry product industry to continue to invest in Scotland, which means more development and job creation. Of course, our commitment, words and ambitions are met with the practical support too. That's why I believe the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, uh, for Finance outlined his draft budget increases to the funding available for tree planting schemes from 36 to 40 million as well as our commitment to deliver for woodland creation and improvement through the forestry grant scheme. 
And now, whilst I'm sure members will wish that we get through the debate without mentioning that dreaded word called Brexit, I do have to gently point out that the forestry sector does receive significant funds from the EU funding, namely the European Agricultural Fund for Rural Development. That fund reimburses 55% of forestry grant scheme and its value over 2014-2020 period is estimated to make available 250 million, 52 million. Final point I wish to make is that the forestry bill is coming. The SNP government will in introduce a forestry bill, which I will believe will deliver a commitment to keep to keeping the Forestry Commission as an asset for the country, but also ensure that the Scottish Government rightly has control of all aspects of forestry and we will have arrangements and how it is governed and supported, and that will help us deliver on our overall ambitions for the sector. To conclude, the presiding officer, once again, grateful for the opportunity to speak in this important debate. Look forward to continuing to support with pleasure this SNP Government and an excellent Cabinet Secretary who has delivered on its manifesto commitments to ensure the best possible future for the forestry sector in Scotland. Thank you. I call Mike Rumbles to be followed by Alexander Burnett. Well, I'm not after a job, but there we are. Can I first of all say that the Liberal Democrats fully recognise the contribution that Scotland's woods and forests make to our people, communities, economy and environment. We welcome moves to fully devolve forestry in Scotland so that it's fully accountable to the Scottish Parliament. We're also fully supportive of the Scottish Government's plans to increase the annual target, as the Conservatives mentioned there, to, from 10,000 hectares a year to 15,000 hectares. However, if we are to be successful in meeting this new target, the resources to achieve it have to be in place. While I recognise that the Scottish Government is increasing the annual level of funding for specific grant aid from its current level of 30 million a year, it's only increasing it by 4 million to 34 million in next year's budget. We took evidence on this in the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Stuart Goodall for, from CONFOR said, and I quote, it's quite clear that if the Forestry Commission is going to deliver the objectives that the Scottish Government has set, the budget will be insufficient. Now, the inability to meet planting targets due to lack of funds was also received in written evidence. It was said that whilst demand in the application process for this current financial year may well exceed 10,000 hectares for the very first time, funding may not be sufficient to meet that demand. And that demands at 10,000 hectares, not 15,000. So, I was at first very sceptical, to say the least, that having failed to reach the 10,000 hectares of new planting target since the target was established some five years ago, simply changing the target to 15,000 hectares per year didn't seem good enough to me. And by the way, I thought that Edward Mountain's contribution to this debate from his personal experience uh, was va a valuable insight into the problems that people do face. And uh, it's a really important that we do have people with experience in farming and, uh, and managing the land in the parliament in these debates. However, in discussion with the cabinet secretary, I have to say that he has made it clear uh, that there will be a stepped approach to achieving the new target. The aim is to raise this target to 12,000 hectares in 20, 2022 to 14,000 to 2022, 24, and 15,000 hectares by 2025. Now, this approach is, to me, far more achievable, and informing the spokespeople of all the parties in this chamber of this change, I think, is both a helpful and constructive approach to this whole subject. Now, Joe O'Hara from Forestry Commission Scotland has made it clear that past, past problems uh, have been addressed, she states that in 2017-18, she is aware of over 11,000 hectares of schemes that are under preparation for planting and is confident that there will be at least 9,000 hectares of new woodland created. The McKinnon report, to which has been referred, has identified a number of mechanisms to streamline, streamline the approval process. Delivery of these mechanisms uh, is a priority, and it must be a priority for the Forestry Commission and we're being told that this has led to an increase in investor confidence. Now, we hope that this is indeed the case. It's clear that as the target for new woodland increases over the next few years, then the planting budget must increase with it. But that, of course, is for future Scottish Government budgets. 
We will have to see if the Scottish Government gets its budget for next year approved in the vote in this chamber a week on Thursday. I have my doubts whether it will pass next week. I personally don't, don't think it will. So I'm not going to look too far ahead to the budgets to come. In cl a clue? Yes, you're pretty switched on. That's good. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, um, the Scottish Liberal Democrats will be supporting the Conservative and Labour amendments and indeed will be, I have to say, I think it's quite good of the Scottish Government to be accepting the Conservative amendment since it takes quite a chunk out of the Government's motion. So I think that's a, that's a very positive step by the Minister to have accepted that. So we will be voting for the Conservative and Labour amendments. Um, we'll be supporting the Government's motion today with its modest budget increase for forestry even if next week we may be voting against the budget as a whole. Thank you. You threw me there a bit, Mr Rumbles. Alexander Burnett, followed by Colin Smith. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And before I start, I'd like to note my registered interest regarding forestry and biomass heating. Uh, so, Deputy Presiding Officer, the forestry sector has long been the backbone of our rural economy. And these forests provide jobs and income for many all over Scotland. And with such a key role to play in Scotland, you would think it would be a priority of the Scottish Government to make sure we have enough skilled professionals to keep the sector alive. However, time and again, the Scottish Government has failed to train up the next generation, and we now face an ever-widening gap between the demand and supply of skilled labour. And this is totally unacceptable. And I am not a lone voice in this respect. In one of the responses to the Scottish Government's future in forestry consultation, Aberdeenshire Council laid it bare. They stated that the Scottish Government should not be following the path in which they underrepresent the commercial and economic impact of forestry. And in the same consultation, those stakeholders who truly know the sector talk of an increasingly centralisation of policy. And unfortunately, uh, at the risk of a forestry ramble with Mr. Stevenson. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I wonder if the member can tell us the number of forestry students at Aberdeen University in 1970 and in 1974 when the Tories left power. I just give a hint. They halved. Alexander Burnett. <laughs> uh, I, I can't comment on his contemporaries, which I'm sure probably what that was referring to. Uh, however, we will be talking about how many forestry students there are in Scotland uh, in the current day, which I think is more important. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately forestry is just the latest addition to the central government grab, whether it's policing, education, fire services, council funding, health boards, the Highlands and Islands enterprise and now forestry. Uh, it is no wonder that we have an ever widening gap between activity on the ground and those who make the decisions. It is no wonder we have a central government that can't hear the need for more skills and labour. And it is no wonder that we have a forestry sector increasingly in despair over how, we will lose, how they will lose forestry expertise into a morph of bureaucracy covering all land issues, the jack of all trades but master of none. So it is no good further centralising forestry management, and such a solution has led us to the chronic problem we have today. So it will come as no surprise to the Cabinet Secretary but Scottish students enrolling in forestry at university has now decreased by a staggering 43% since 2003. The number of students studying forestry at the University of Edinburgh is now near zero, while Aberdeen University has had to merge its once renowned forestry department. And the lack of interest is of no surprise when the route of being a forestry expert or chartered forester in a standalone forestry commission is to disappear. So we need to take a proactive approach to getting the next generation excited in Scotland's forests. And nobody knows how to do this better than local communities. And dare I say it, businesses operating in the forestry sector. And that's why regularly tours are organized by local schools to visit my biomass facility in Bankery. And I know I'd disappoint Miss Martin if I didn't me mention an interest of mine. <laughs> now, a Boyne and Bankery Academy students are taken round the facility and have to find answers relating to their fuel topics in the curriculum. And pupils and teachers leave with a much greater understanding of the workings and economics of biomass and the timber supply operations. Now, I cannot guarantee that these children will go into the forestry sector, but they will now have an understanding of what the sector can offer them. 
If, however, this Parliament wants to represent all of Scotland, then it needs to listen to those who make our economy function. We hear stories from forestry companies of having to go to other sectors, persuading their employees to retrain. So how did we get to this state of affairs? The fact of the matter is that Scottish Government should have been planning for this. This is not some flash in the pan issue. This is a subject in a sector that can plan by the decade, and this Government has had nearly a decade of failing to understand it. They knew we had a massive skills gap, and they chose to ignore it. So I asked the Cabinet Secretary, why not break the habit of a lifetime and listen to our forestry experts? Thank you. Colin Smith, followed by Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Can I refer members to my register of interest as a, a local councillor in Dumfries and Galloway? I'm sure members will forgive me if I'm somewhat parochial in my contribution in today's debate, but my home region of Dumfries and Galloway has one of the highest concentrations of forestry in the UK, with 31% of the land covered with woods and forests, exceeding the Scottish average of 18% referred to by the Cabinet Secretary earlier. The 211,000 hectares range from the, the Great Spruce Forest of Galloway and Estill Muir through the traditional estate forests, such as those of the Buclue Estates, to the, the small native and farm woodlands that are so important to the beautiful landscape of the region. Not surprisingly, Dumfries and Galloway is a, is a major timber producing area, harvesting some 30% of Scotland's homegrown timber annually. As a result, it is home to some of the, the top sawmills in Britain, such as BSW in Dalbiti and James Jones & Sons near Lockerbie, as well as a number of smaller mills, all processing local timber. The region is also home to Scotland's largest biomass power station near Lockerbie, which burns around 475,000 tonnes of wood per year, displacing up to 140,000 tonnes of greenhouse gases. We have many local engineering companies that design and build forestry and timber transport machinery, supporting the industry locally, but also selling equipment across the world. And we have some of the largest forestry plant and equipment suppliers in the UK. Unlike many other parts of Scotland, the majority of the timber grown in Dumfries and Galloway is processed within the area, reducing our carbon emissions, supporting our low carbon economy, and crucially retaining and creating badly needed local employment. The timber industry is unquestionably one of the most important employers within the region, with more than 3,000 jobs across all sectors, many within some of the most remote rural areas. With timber production continuing to increase as post-war forests reach maturity, there is a potential for more employment opportunities, growth which is almost unique for industries in a rural economy. But with those growth opportunities also come a number of challenges, which I want to touch on briefly. The first challenge, of course, is ensuring that there is sufficient planting to support the expansion of the industry. We know we have a relatively healthy timber supply until the late 2030s, but then there is a projected drop-off. That is why I very much support the Government's new target to, to plant 15,000 hectares of new forestry each year by 2025. However, the reality is the Government has no choice but to expand beyond its original 10,000 hectares annual target if it is to meet the aim of 100,000 hectares of planting by 2022, because past targets have, as the Cabinet Secretary readily acknowledges, been missed in the past. A lack of local or regional targets in a national strategy and a past forestry grant scheme that was seen as slow and bureaucratic has resulted in those targets being missed. The sudden rise also of onshore wind farm developments in recent years in many areas also led to a loss of existing and proposed woodland. So a great deal of work does need to be done to deliver on the government's targets, and I very much welcome the McKinnon report, which offers a number of very positive and sensible ways forward to remove the barriers to planting. But of course, we don't just need to plant and grow the trees, we need to harvest them and remove them. And that's the next challenge I want to touch on. The minor road network in many regions, such as Dumfries and Galloway, which is so important to the transfer of timber, hasn't changed a great deal over the years, and the capacity to take timber haulage can be very limiting. There are many narrow and structurally weak roads locally that are incredibly challenging for articulated vehicles, and of course, any increase in heavy traffic on minor roads can lead to disruption for many local communities. These rural roads that serve a forest remain a potential barrier to the supply chain and future increased planting. That is why the Strategic Timber Transport Fund in Scotland has been vital since it was established over a decade ago, distributing some £25 million to 119 projects throughout Scotland with a total value of some £55 million. I can think of many projects across Dumfries and Galloway, such as the, the Estill Muir Bypass, that have benefited from that fund. And I hope the Government will continue the fund, but I would also urge the Cabinet Secretary to look at the level of intervention. At present, projects are generally supported to a maximum 
of 50 per cent of eligible costs, with local government or private industry having to meet the remaining 50 per cent. Now, given the current pressures on council budgets, I would hope the government will consider at least an 80 per cent intervention level, or in some exceptional cases, full funding. 80 per cent is already the level of intervention when it comes to projects which have exceptional environmental, community and social benefits, and is the level of the government provides for major flood prevention schemes. Increasing the intervention level of the fund at a time when councils are facing cuts is more likely to ensure bids come forward and the fund is fully utilised. The final challenge I want to touch on is the completion of devolution of forestry. I accept that incorporating the management of the forestry estate into the Scottish Government does provide a framework for an integrated land management unit, allowing for a more holistic overview of the management of the forest estate. However, the current forestry model does provide a great deal of engagement at local level with stakeholders from communities to local authorities on the management of the estate. In Dumfries and Galloway, the estate is currently governed by two forest districts, Galloway District and Dumfries and Borders District, which between them cover some 171,000 hectares. The current arrangements, in addition to the production role, have played a crucial part in developing the wider health and recreational benefits of forests in Dumfries and Galloway, from the development of the Seven Stains cycling project to the Scottish Dark Skies Observatory within Galloway Forest Park, a park which attracts some 1.1 million visitors a year. Indeed, it is so successful that, in my view, the next logical step would be to develop the park into Scotland's next natural national park, but uh, like the Cabinet Secretary, that does wander a little off the script. But given the positive role of local forest districts and their outreach functions, it is crucial they are reflected in any new management proposals. We need to guard against either an overly centralised structure, which sadly is often the case when it comes to structural change, and we have to ensure that the focus of any new structure is not only on timber production, crucial though that is, but also recognises the wider role of forestry estate in supporting local biodiversity targets, health and recreation, and of course tourism, so vital to a region like Dumfries and Galloway. Thank you. The last of the open speakers is Gillian Martin. Officer, I welcome this motion and I agree that forestry has a crucial role to play in achieving Scotland's climate targets. I declare a special interest as the species champion for the yew, which is thought to be Scotland's oldest tree in the form of the famous Fortingall yew in Persia. I would first like to pay tribute to the work of Woodland Trust Scotland. The Trust owns and manages over 60 sites across over 11,000 hectares in Scotland, including Den Wood near Old Meldrum in my constituency, where I met some of their representatives to discuss the work that they do. While it's important that we continue to plant more trees and do everything we can to meet the Scottish Government's ambitious targets, it's also essential that we do our utmost to protect and conserve our existing forests and woodlands. As well as providing a number of walks and a habitat for wildlife, including buzzards and roe deer, Den Wood is used by a local group called Gardening for Kids. The group runs outdoor classes based on forest school principles and is extremely valuable in teaching youngsters from our local schools about the environment. As any pedagogue will tell you, outdoor education is invaluable and a cursory look at the top performing Finnish schools and how much time they spend in woodland classrooms is surely an indication of its value. Woodlands like Denwood are an important educational resource and they provide an illustration of the development of forestry in the 21st century and show it to be much more than just the management of timber supply. By working with children's groups like this, we help them understand, understand how important forests and forestry are to our society. And yesterday I visited Fintry School near, near Turriff, who were awarded their fourth green flag. Now they know the importance of tree planting. The Cabinet Secretary will be delighted to hear they've done their bit in helping us reach our target. They planted 60 trees last year in the school grounds. As well as its economic, educational and wider environmental importance, forestry can also play a significant part in the nation's flood prevention strategy. My constituency of Aberdeenshire East was one of the areas heavily affected by Storm Frank eh, last year, with residents in Inverurie, Ellen, Methlick, Fivey and Rothy Norman amongst those impacted by the floods at that time. Even before Storm Frank hit last January, the average cost of flooding in Scotland was estimated in 2015 to be 280 million per year. And of course, the psychological and emotional cost, as many of my constituents know, is significant and can't be measured. Bodies such as CONFER, the Woodland Trust and the World Wildlife Fund have all proposed that the strategic tree planting be made a key component of efforts to mitigate against flooding. 
Indeed, the SNP manifesto supports the planting of woodland, which can help prevent flooding and assist in water basin management. Work is ongoing to develop strategies for the Don, Uri and Ithan rivers in my constituency to prevent and or mitigate any future floods. And this process can feel frustratingly drawn out to residents whose lives have been upended by the recent floods. But it is essential that we do not make things worse in our haste to make things better. It is vital that all avenues are explored, ensuring the devastation in the wake of Storm Frank is not repeated. In addition to conventional prevention techniques and as part of an anti-flooding strategy, tree planting could play a significant role. The Scottish Government noted in 2011 that the state of knowledge regarding the effectiveness of natural techniques such as tree planting and flood prevention was evolving, but there's still much research to be done in this area. However, in a study published in March last year, led by the Universities of Birmingham and Southampton, scientists found that planting trees could reduce the height of flooding, uh, the height of floodwaters in towns by up to 20%. Dr. Simon Dixon, the study's lead author from the University of Birmingham's Institute of Forestry Research, said, we believe that tree planting can make a big contribution to reducing flood risk and should be part of a wider flood risk management approach, including conventional flood defences. An example of where tree planting has been employed as part of a flood mitigation strategy uh, is in the previously flood hit town of Pickering in North Yorkshire where over 40 hectares of woodland were planted and a study of that scheme indicated that flooding was prevented that would otherwise have occurred. While tree planting was only one part of the whole range of measures implemented, it was a significant part. I would suggest in closing, presiding officer, that our tree planting scheme could assist in the Scottish Government's aim to deliver on its manifest manifesto commitment, not only to meeting its climate change targets, but to aid the prevention of flooding, moves which many of my constituents would be very supportive of. Thank you. We now come to closing speeches, and I call on Andy Whiteman to wind up for the Green Party. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Presiding Officer, and thanks to all who have contributed uh, to the debate this afternoon. Um, I'll repeat the uh, uh, comments I made in my opening remarks in response to the Cabinet Secretary's uh, speech. We look forward to discussing further uh, our ideas for uh, the new forestry uh, uh, bill. Uh, we certainly, as an, uh, an overarching aim, want this bill to be much, much more ambitious. And I cite another example here. I mean, if we're wanting to get forestry expansion, I don't think we can rely on traditional so-called investment routes. Uh, there's no reason why, for example, we shouldn't be launching a national people's forest, crowdfunded uh, by the people of Scotland. Uh, there's money there for people to invest uh, in, in forests, and we, we need to tap into these non-traditional uh, uh, routes. Uh, Peter Chapman mentioned uh, the fact that forestry is a long-term business, and I think we'd all uh, agree with that. He also talked about the fact that there's very little history of farmers doing uh, forestry. I'm sure Peter Chapman's well aware that that's because of the lack of land reform uh, in Scotland. Most of the land in Scotland was managed by tenant farmers, and it wasn't until this parliament in 2003, 2003, gave tenant farmers the right to plant trees. And even then, it was a constrained right. And it was land reform across Europe that led to the pattern of small-scale farm forestry that we see in countries like uh, Austria uh, and uh, France. And nevertheless, we will be supporting uh, the Conservative uh, Amendment uh, this evening. Rhoda Grant talked about the importance of getting timber to market, uh, and, and we agree. Uh, but too often, in our view, uh, timber is taken to markets far too far away. In 2012, I well remember the previous sec Cabinet Secretary, Pete, uh, uh, Minister, Environment Minister, rather, Peter Wheelhouse, who launched a, um, a, a, a £3 million pier built on the island uh, of Mull. This was to take timber away from Mull to distant markets. Uh, we don't agree that that is a good use of public money. We think that the forest economy of Mull should be developed on Mull, as other European countries do. For example, a number of years ago, I visited a commune uh, in Norway, which was a very similar size to Mull and had a very similar uh, forest cover. It has two sawmills, uh, on the island, and it's also got a very, very large prefabricated timber house building uh, project. They export high value products, and that's what places like uh, Mull should do. No minister 
uh, in Norway would stand up and be proud of spending £3 million to export raw materials uh, from the Norwegian countryside. Emma Harper talked about investors, the importance of investors, and Scotland being open for business. But who are these investors? I despair at her lack of curiosity. I could sit down with her and talk about the people who own the forests in Dumfries and Galloway, many of them absentees, many in offshore tax havens. There's one Russian oligarch. Uh, these large areas of forestry plantations are surrounded by lock gates, and there's no community uh, benefit. Uh, Finlay Carson and Alexander Burnett also talked about the tendency of the Scottish Government to centralise things. Now, that is a sentiment I share in many instances, but I don't understand the critique in this instance. The National Forest Estate is owned by Scottish ministers, which is about as centralised uh, as you can get, and Forest Enterprise is accountable to Scottish ministers. In fact, the proposals that the Scottish Government have uh, for forestry in their proposed bill make very little difference. And I hope if the Conservatives are as um, critical of the tendency to centralise as I am, they'll they, they will join with the Greens in supporting uh, our amendment and trying to get more decentralisation of forest management and ownership uh, across Scotland. Stuart Stevenson as well talked about the strategic interests again, uh, and I agree. Uh, and that's why I think historically there has been cross-party support for forestry expansion in this uh, parliament. Claudia Beamish talked about more community and cooperative ownership, and I very much uh, endorse that. She talked about the initiatives taking part, place in the south of Scotland, which Colin uh, Smith referred to as well, in terms of biomass, etc., and local approaches. And that underscores the need for a local approach. It always has underscored the need for a local approach. In countries like France, 30% of the public forests. They're not owned by the state, they're owned by the local communes. And that's why places in, uh, in many of these forest communes are very, very wealthy. They own the land, they own the trees, and they can develop a local economy. Edward Mountain talked about indicative forestry maps. Well, we had these in the 1980s, indeed, I remember. He will, I'm sure, in response to the controversy over planting in places like uh, the Flow Country. We now have the land use strategy. Uh, and that has the potential to build indicative maps. And I think once areas are identified that where, where we should be expanding forest, I think it's time, given our climate change obligations, that planting should be obligatory. I think the voluntary approach has failed. And this would include very vulnerable land, land such as the hillsides above the A83 and the rest, and be thankful, which, if it were, if Scotland were a normal European country like Switzerland or Austria, would be protection forest. It would be illegal. It would be illegal. Uh, there would be a criminal sanction against any owner or manager who grazed those hills as they are uh, just now. And Gillian Martin mentioned this importance in the context of flooding. She also mentioned it in uh, the importance of forestry in terms of children. And again, across Europe, family forestry is widespread and it's also vertically integrated so that the 54,000 forest uh, owners in the south of Sweden, for example, own the processing company to which their uh, timber is, um, is, is, is sold. So I just conclude by repeating our view that a new forestry act has massive uh, opportunities. The government's existing goals in the new bill are limited, though welcome, and we look forward to further discussions with the government on how to make the forestry bill uh, suitable for the 21st century. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. I call on Rhoda Grant to wind up for Labour. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, this has been a really good um, debate with a lot of consensus, I think, um, and the acknowledgement that the value that forestry provides, and indeed I think the debate has shown um, the breadth of value that that provides from climate change, biodiversity, um, and indeed um, economic and community well-being. So I think those points have been well made. Um, turning first to the environment, which I probably didn't touch on much in my opening um, speech. Um, Claudia Beamish and Graham Day talked about carbon sequestration and the use of wood um, and forestry for that. And I think that's something that we almost take for granted. Um, but there are stages in how we should use timber to get the best carbon uh, sequestration, looking at high-end uses to start with, building, furniture and the like, um, then recycling that when need be into processing and then finally into heat. And if we could build that into our plan for forestry, I think we would make the best use of our um, woodlands. Uh, it's suffice to say that um, depending on the needs for things like biomass, it is always better to grow that very close to um, where it's going to be used. Um, 
we need um, to also look at our um, natural hardwoods, and I, I know others may disagree, but some of the natural hardwoods that we have had planted were never really managed properly, and they need to be properly managed to get the maximum use out of them. Um, Claudia Beamish talked about deer management, and I think that is really important, because if we're going to have good quality forestry, we need to make sure that that is not grazed when the trees are young, especially by deer, but uh, uh, by sheep and cattle as well. Um, she also talked about peatlands um, and sometimes the conflict between protecting peatlands and forestry, and we need to be very clear on that. That's why we need a plan about how we uh, take forward our, our forestry to make sure that it doesn't interfere with other things that are good for the environment, but also that we maximise the impact of it. Um, others, um, Richard Lyle and Gillian Martin, talked about flood management and prevention through forestry. Another issue that we touched on very, very little, while well, certainly I did in my opening speech. Um, can I turn again to the Green Amendment? I'm still not totally clear as to what they are trying to do. Um, with, with their amendment. Of course, um, we, the, the Forestry Commission, and indeed all of government, should encourage community ownership. And when, that, uh, when land ownership is in the public domain, they should look at how they can work with communities and others um, to manage that, and indeed uh, transfer ownership where community ownership is right. We would expect that to be in place for the Forestry Commission but as well for other government and indeed local government organisations. Um, while NGOs are, tend, can own forestry and tend to be more sympathetic landowners for, towards community needs and that, they are still landowners. They can buy and trade their forestry on the, the open market. So I wouldn't want them or to see them treated the same as community landowners. And therefore, my concern about the Green Amendment remains and wh where they're going. I think we're sympathetic to some of the, the direction of travel, but not very clear um, if there are unforeseen um, circumstances, indeed, that people that forestry could then end up in, in private ownership. And that would, I think, not be something we would want, but I think something the Greens would not want either. Can I turn to transport? Um, Stuart Stevenson talked about um, marine transportation, and of course, I mean, I had the pleasure of being in Rasa yesterday. It was a beautiful day. I didn't see timber being extracted by, by boat, but I'm sure it is there, and certainly um, the pier looked like it was more than up to cope with that. So I think we need to look at those methods of um, timber extraction because it's very short. Stuart Stevenson. It's not a pier. There's a special vessel that just goes on at the beach and creates a temporary pier. Good grand. Even better, it can be used elsewhere. Um, Colin Smith talked about um, narrow um, and weak roads in, in rural areas, and I think he's absolutely right. He made a plea about the Strategic Timber uh, Transport Fund, um, and I think funds like that do help um, local communities and indeed local co government uh, put in place uh, methods of timber extraction. And I very much um, hope that the government will look at what he said, I think, um, constructively, and see how they can help promote this scheme with local government and indeed others. Um, and I absolutely agree with Andy Whiteman when he talked about transportation of timber. Yes, of course, where possible, we should have a uh, timber grown close to where it's being used. But if we're going to use it properly, that's not always possible because some of the needs for timber are within our urban areas where the best land for growing timber is often in our rural areas. Um, we talked about planting, and I think there was great agreement that we needed a lot more planting, and that should be, be encouraged. And maybe the funding uh, that follows planting could also dictate where that planting happens, so that it happens in the best possible areas. Uh, Alexander Burnett talked about skills, and of course there's a need to ensure that we have the right skills in place. We also need to address uh, the gender gap in forestry, uh, encouraging women to become involved. It's a perfect um, career path for women, and we need to make sure that they find that accessible as well. It's been a good debate, and I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to listen at this debate and indeed as the bill goes forward uh, through the Parliament. And I look forward to many more discussions about forestry and how we can make that bill work for all of Scotland. 
Thank you very much. And I'll call on Morris Golden to wind up for the Conservative Party. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Along with the majestic mountains, cragged coasts and rolling hills, forests are one of the iconic images of Scotland's natural beauty. Not on, only are they rich, biodiverse habitats, they act as a huge carbon sink, provide us with the raw materials and help to support 25,000 jobs as well as contribute 1 billion to our economy. Truly, our forests are something to be cherished. This was a point well made by Finlay Carson who flagged how important the sector is to his constituency, as did Colin Smith. Andy Whiteman revealed he was blacklisted by the forestry sector, but also mentioned a lack of ambition from the Scottish Government and a promotion of forest communes. Uh, unfortunately, we, unfortunately, we don't agree with uh, these points, but I think we can all agree on the need for more planting of trees. Stuart Stevenson spoke about making the case to farmers of the intrinsic value of forestry. And Claudia Beamish outlined the French model, an agroforestry approach, in an interesting contribution. Graham Day highlighted the issue of deer management and the cost to the public purse of fencing, all worthwhile contributions to this debate. But we acknowledge that the SNP government recognised the value of forestry, as can be seen in their plans to expand the area of forestry in Scotland. Anyone who cares about our environment and our economy would, of course, welcome such an expansion. In last week's draft climate change plan, the SNP government announced that they would increase the current target for woodland creation by 50% to plant 50,000 hectares of woodland per year. Mike Rumbles made the point that given the SNP government haven't actually made the current target yet, how can this parliament be assured that they will deliver an even bigger target? The SNP government also said that they would plant 100 million trees by the end of 2015. They missed that target by more than 11 million trees. And Edward Mountain flagged the issue of the lack of funding in this area. However, Fergus Ewing has sought to assure this parliament. I respect that. I also welcome Fergus's commitment to work across the chamber for the benefit of Scotland and to continue to meet his New Year's resolution on that approach. However, we see in action when it comes to the impact of invasive rhododendron on Scottish woodlands, despite being described by one ecologist as the biggest ecological threat facing Scotland, barely more than one-tenth of rhododendron spread has been removed over the past five years. I urge the SNP government to tackle this problem rather than leave it to landowners alone. We have a number of concerns about the SNP government's proposed organisational arrangements for the Forestry Commission. The proposals could lead to the type of centralisation and political interference that may underline the goals we all share, a point made by Peter Chapman and Alexander Burnett. Furthermore, Rhoda Grant raised concerns of career civil servants running our forestry sector, a point we would also agree with. On the other hand, there are occasions where central leadership is required. The biorefinery roadmap for Scotland was also launched in January 2015, to much fanfare and quite right too, because this sector is in dire need of leadership. Overall, that means a more active role for government, not stepping back, but stepping up, to back business and ensure more people in all corners of this country share in the benefits of its success. This approach is similar to the modern industrial strategy recently launched by the UK government, which will make Britain and Scotland, with Scottish government support, stronger, fairer, and more successful than it is today. Biorefining means the integrated production of materials, chemicals, fuels, and energy from biomass. Timber value chain co-products such as tree stumps, brash and thinnings, as well as residues, could provide a valuable feedstock for a biorefinery. The first stage of feedstock analysis has been beset with delays. 
but with 2017, the year outlined in the roadmap for feasibility studies on the three main feedstocks following on from technical appraisals, in order to build a compelling case for a biorefinery construction in Scotland, it is not too late for the roadmap. I would urge the Cabinet Secretary to ensure that this roadmap is delivered on time. Forestry represents a massive opportunity to deliver positive economic and environmental impacts for Scotland. Scottish forestry needs a government that will show leadership and recognise what we can do better. A government that supports stakeholders, not one that walks away from problems, and most of all, a government that puts results before rhetoric. I urge the Chamber to support the amendment in the name of Peter Chapman. Thank you very much. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Fergus Ewing, to wind up the debate. Uh, well, presiding officer, I, I, I think this has been an excellent debate, and if I may say so, Mr. Golden uh, finished the debate, concluded the debate in the constructive and positive fashion with which most of the contributors addressed it. So I'm very grateful to all of the members for their contribution. And I think the, the wider community of people who are interested in forestry, either as a, a livelihood, a passion, a hobby, uh, will feel that this debate has uh, provided um, a lot of support for their respective aims and visions of what they wish from forestry in Scotland. Um, I do want to try to address many of the points that uh, have been made in the debate. Should I fail to do so and it's impossible to address all in eight minutes, then if members are particularly keen that I do that, then please write to me. Uh, and I repeat the, the offer that I made uh, exclusively to the Greens that if uh, members wish to meet with me and discuss these matters as we go forward, particularly with the Forestry Bill, then my door is open and I'm very keen to have discussions so that we can iron out potential areas of disagreement, as Mr. Rumbles, I think, very kindly mentioned that we did in his remarks, because I think very often a bit of prior discussion enables us so to do, and, and also uh, uh, exchanges in the committee serve that purpose, as Mr. Mountain indicated. Um, I think there is a very important role for regional policy, as I think one of the Conservative members mentioned in his speech. I'm sorry, I can't remember which one, but we do strongly believe that, that, uh, that, uh, that there should be a regional approach, and the Scottish Lo Local Authorities publication Forest and Woodland Strategies are used to identify suitable areas for woodland expansion. It's not for me to determine where those areas are. I mean, that would be inappropriately centralist. It is for those locally elected councillors working with their communities, community councillors, to do so. Uh, and the Scottish Government believes that local authorities should play that important role. It's essential that we have a partnership with local authorities, and that's how I seek to deal with them in my areas of responsibility. Mr Smith mentioned, I think, the woodland loss and compensatory planting issue. Uh, and that, of course, is an issue, but a very small part, according to the information I have in a report published in just last year, is attributable to the woodland loss through renewable schemes, 0.12% of the total forestry area. And we welcome, of course, the compensatory planting required by local authorities of developers as uh, a way to plant more trees, something that this debate has focused on. Um, the timber transport issue is very important, and that was mentioned by, I think, uh, I think all the Labour speakers today, and Rhoda Grant majored on that, and the budget continues to support the timber transport scheme, which has provided nearly 25 million, presiding officer, since uh, 2005 to 134 projects. And of course, we want to work effectively with local government in order to maximise what we can do. Many speakers mentioned the importance of business, and uh, in my own constituency, in fact, we live a, less than a, a kilometre away from BSW's boat of Garton Mill, which I revisited again recently. And these are mills like that, and as was mentioned by Mr. Mountain, Gordon, and Jones, the, these are at the root of rural life and work in many parts of Scotland, in the Highlands and Islands, and in the borders to Fries and Galloway, as has been mentioned by a great many speakers, including Emma Harper. Um, and of course, the industry has pointed out that long-term forecasts for softwood production show a peak in the 2030s, followed by a trough. And this trough is now within the time frame for long-term loans. So the processing industry is concerned about the availability of future investment funding 
And that's one of many reasons why we need to up our game in what Mr. Rumbles rightly characterized, I think, in his contribution as a stepped increase. It can only be a stepped increase because capacity can't go from uh, to double overnight in a year. I mean, nurseries take some time to increase their stock, as I learned when I visited Christie's Elite not so long ago, and the contractor capacity to actually do the work. Reliant, I may say, and many migrant workers from the EU, presiding officer, who we hope will still be welcome in Scotland, uh, is, of course, another fe factor why we, we can't go from here to 15,000 straight away. But I was pleased that members recognised that uh, as the information that Joe O'Hara provided, we are making progress uh, there anent. Many members talked about the devolution of forestry, and I was pleased for the broad and principled support. Let me absolutely emphasise that uh, uh, in completing devolution, we want to ensure a number of things. Firstly, we will work with the UK in respect of disease and research, and that assurance was sought. It is freely given. Of course, we will continue to do that. Secondly, will it be accountable? Yes, of course. Our actions will be accountable to this parliament, uh, both to the committees and to individual members in, in their work. Uh, so I think it will be, bring a greater accountability. Thirdly, will it bring in a new era of centralism where <coughs> I, I would play the, the role of the centralist in chief? Well, I have to say, presiding officer, I, I think I miscast for the role of a Scottish Strelnikov. I don't really see myself in that light nor do I tend to apply for the part. We will work in partnership with local authorities and communities because that is the way to do it. It's the correct way to do it. We are already engaging with industry. I've held two summits. I've met with NGOs. We will meet with NGOs once again very shortly. Uh, we, have analyzed the, we, are, we are analyzing the consultation responses and these will be published in February and we're committed to introduce the bill in this session in accordance with our manifesto uh, pledge. I recognize that we have not planted enough trees, and to do so, we need a variety of things, and one of them, as Mr. Burnett rightly said, is skills. And I'm very pleased the Forestry Commission has led by example, where 98 apprentices have gained employment with the, F, with the Forestry Commission, and their graduate development program has employed 15 graduates since 2007, and the Forestry College at Baloch does a great job in my own constituency, uh, near Inverness, presiding officer, uh, and will continue to do so. But he is right to raise the issue, because working together we have to do more, and we want to encourage more young people to pursue what I think will be a terrifically, terrific uh, career for many people. Let me uh, mention also the excellent work that uh, Jim McKinnon, uh, CBE, carried out after being asked so to do uh, by me in last summer. He visited a huge number of people. He gave freely of his, of his time to a great extent. He produced a very valuable report. The Forestry Commission is about to publish a delivery plan. We will listen very carefully to the points that were made. I, I think if I, if I may suggest that members might benefit from reading paragraph 61 at Sequitur, which talk about the role of the accredited specialist. I think there, it is an idea that's worthy of strong consideration. There are arguments against but I think perhaps if a reading of those paragraphs would address some of the doubts uh, which we uh, have heard expressed and are perfectly understandable. Uh, deer fencing is, of course, an essential <coughs> tool in ensuring the successful establishment of new uh, woodlands, uh, and private forestry is likely to continue to rely principally on fences to protect woodland creation schemes. However, as was pointed out by Rhoda Grant, by Mr. Whiteman, and certainly by Mr. Day, who who made uh, some remarks about this, we do need to have robust deer management and we need to work with bodies uh, such as the Association of Deer Management in order to do that and work in collaboration with everyone in order to find um, a way ahead. Uh, Mr. Whiteman uh, enlivened the debate with uh, his contribution, I thought, uh, and uh, he made the novel suggestion that forestry should be made obligatory um, I have to say, I'm not quite sure how this novel suggestion would accord with Article 1 of the first protocol of the European Convention on Human Rights and Freedoms. Uh, if he knows how that could be done and navigated, could he please write to me there and end? But I do feel myself that it's far better to work to encourage uh, those involved in land management in Scotland to persuade them 
that forestry is a sensible long-term investment, as indeed it is, in the right place, at the right time, in the right way, not to tell them, you must do this, even were it legal, which I suspect, presiding officer, one would find it is not. But on the positive side, and I think I'm due to close, presiding officer, unless I've got another few minutes to carry on, in which case I will. 54 seconds, thank you, sir. Um, I want to close uh, by stating that we are absolutely committed to further the cause of community ownership of woodlands, uh, just as we did, and I played a part when Energy Minister in encouraging community ownership of renewables. I think there's an overwhelming opportunity now for us to work together, private sector and public sector, NGOs and professionals, the government here and in the local authorities and in communities throughout Scotland in order to find ways to continue the good work that we've done with over 30 community ownership schemes and to build on possibly new and innovative ways how that can be carried out. In conclusion, presiding officer, may I thank all members for what I think was perhaps one of the most positive and constructive debates that there has been uh, in this session of Parliament, uh, <coughs> at least those in which I've taken part. Thank you. That concludes our debate on developing 